Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. Oh, the mics are working. Fantastic. Um, wow. <laughs> what an incredible day. This room, um, I've done a lot of work with Susan at Lukark a few years ago. We, we had done an event in Ottawa, and we sold very, very few tickets for it. The event organizer said, we'll sell out because Susan's here. A week before, there was 100 of 1,300 tickets sold, and Susan came to me and said to me, Scott, it was you who said to me, if we don't have the courage to do these events to empty rooms, we'll never fill them. You proved the point today. Thank you so much for being here and filling this room. It's incredible. And I did tweet Susan about it, what's going on today. Um, the words that we heard today are incredible. Uh, Rita's words, and I have to start with it, I added to it, her three words, and we can do that in this room. Fix society, please. That's what I'm going to talk about, um, is what we can do to answer Rita's plea. I believe that the greatest grief is the untold story. The greatest grief. Not that I lost my dad to suicide, which I'll talk about, but that I was forced to keep it quiet. Not that Rita is who she is, was the greatest grief, but that she was forced to keep it to herself. That's the greatest grief. It's been said that one in five people deal with a mental health issue. This room is not statistically immune to it. Right here, one in five people are dealing with mental health issues. It's not another room, not another school, not another family. It's right here in this room. We need to realize that. Today in this conference, and Rita touched on this as well, You've come to this conference with ignorance. Now let's define what that is, because sometimes that's an offensive word. It's a lack of knowledge. But today you're going to leave with choices. You're going to have choices to create change, or choices on the status quo. By show of hands in here, how many people here are public servants? Get paid by city, provincial, federal government. Almost all of it. Almost all of us. As, as public servants, we, we tend to label ourselves. I'm a firefighter, so I tend to label myself by this badge on my shoulder, firefighter. There's, there's, there's cops in the room. We're police officers. We're paramedics. We're doctors. We're nurses. We're teachers. The reality is we're all public servants. And our job is to make our communities better and safer. So if we were all at a table and we put an issue on the table, oh, I've got a rock. I love this rock. And that's the issue. We're surrounding the table and we say, okay, how can we deal with this issue, whatever it is? And we use a skill that's at the table. We're all doing the same job, making our communities better. So as a public servant, I truly believe what I do on this stage today is an extension of what I do as a firefighter. It's no different. Um, and it applies to the, pub the public sector in the same way. We're all public servants whose job it is to make our communities better. I believe as a public servant, if I can make a difference in communities, it's my obligation to do it. Uh, to create change, we need to embrace and encourage and accept vulnerability. Andrew hit it really, really well. People create change, not organizations. People respond to people in crisis. Organizations don't. People have vision. People have commitment. And people matter. So sometimes we hide behind our organizations because we need that courage. When I was talking with Mark, he wanted me to somehow tie all the stories in together. So I'm going to start with that. Perry and Will gave you a great gift of knowledge and indigenous culture and history in its beauty and richness. I want you to Google, and here's a task. I'm going to give you tasks to do. There's going to be something you leave here to do. I want you to Google truth and reconciliation calls to action. There's 94 of them. Every one of us in our personal life, professional life, can pick one of those, just one, and put it to use in work tomorrow. It could be about health, it could be about wellness, it could be about sport, it could be about ed education. Go and find one of them. Say, I'm going to work on that. They're plain language, we can do that. Perry and Will gave us that gift. Um, Andrew, Andrew's story really helps us break the glass shell of labels we put on 
each other. But more importantly, the labels we put on ourselves. And I can relate to Andrew, and we've been talking for a long time. The label that's on me as a firefighter is created in children's books. How can I ever live up to that? But it's a label that's there, and probably a bigger one that I put on myself. We can't do that. Harriet's story gives us a view that's, that's so special. I can't imagine as a parent what she went through. I can't imagine as a social worker what she went through. But she shared it so eloquently. And Rita, what an incredible gift. I was in Sudbury last week, and I got to sit with Rita for a couple hours. Not only did she give me a great gift, she gave my sons an incredible gift. Because now I know how to talk to them. I tried a couple weeks ago and I stumbled through it. I was horrible. After meeting with Rita, it's not a problem. But we have to have that vulnerability and the willingness to listen and use those lessons. Alex Bowman said to me, who's on our advisory team, and you'll recognize that name in Sudbury, he said to me, Scott, when I started the project, Scott, when, Al, when Terry Fox dipped his leg in the, the ocean, there was nobody there to watch. So continue your journey even when you don't believe people are listening. When you take the messages from today and start doing something about them, you're going to see people go the other way and not want to talk about not want to do something. But persevere through it. I can tell you the project that I started in 2009 was supposed to be one year. Still not done. But we kept going to do it and sharing stories. The first story I want to begin to share with you is what I do as a firefighter. When we go to calls as firefighters and first responders when a suicide happens, we go in, there's often nothing we can do about it. And we go to leave that home, and we can look in a kitchen, see a family who's gone through the greatest trauma of their life, bar none. And based on our protocols and practices and training, we leave. We're not trained to deal with that. Now, if we were to go back to that same call and I go to leave and I see a bone sticking out of somebody's arm, I'm really well trained to walk up to them, assess, treat, transport them, and they will be healed in two months. Now, let's compare those two traumas. That's just like me today. If we had a car accident outside and fire, tr fire shows up, EMS and police, the car's rolled over three times as a family in the car. And we're assessing it's the greatest trauma of their life, right? They've just had a car accident. They've got broken necks and they're banged up. And we have a neighbor show up and said, hey, I know them. I'm going to take them home. And we say, okay. Because that's what they did to me when I was 17 years old. They left me in the kitchen. It was the greatest trauma of my life. But it wasn't just me. My 11-year-old sister was over there. My 21-year-old sister was there. And my 16-year-old sister was there. And my 18-year-old brother was there. And health care was nowhere to be found. And that was 33 years later. I did a call two weeks ago in Thunder Bay for a suicide, and we did the same damn thing. 33 years later. So some would say, what can we do about that? Well, anybody here from public health? Ever heard of the Healthy Babies, Healthy Moms program? So, when, so Healthy Babies, Healthy Moms was brought in because of postpartum depression with women. What happens, women have babies, and I learned this through my oldest son when he was born, that the health unit finds out about it. They phone the mom to make sure she's okay, offer services, and then they do home visits and offer services within the community. Make sure mom's okay. That exact same program I took to our MPP a couple of years ago. It's a single page sheet. This is what we can do for suicide. This is what I needed 30 years ago. We could do this today. We can do it today. Often I hear about public health, oh, we don't do mental health. Yes, you do. And that's one of the most amazing programs. And you link to existing community resources. You don't make anything up. The resources are there. They're within this room right here, right now. But it's connecting them. But it's also recognizing that I had a problem, that that was the greatest trauma of my life. So we can do something. I grew up in Marathon, Ontario, on the north shore of Lake Superior. Beautiful place. There's a photograph of it. I was flying there last year with a good friend of mine, who ironically lost his sister to suicide. Um, and when I was 17, I lost my dad. 
And like I say, there was nothing there for us. Um, soon, I, soon after, I moved away to Calgary. I was going to school in Calgary. And life sort of went on with me. But over the years, when I became a firefighter, I, did, uh, I was a paramedic and then became a firefighter, I never hid the fact that my father died by suicide. For some reason, I could talk about it, and we're all different. And often people would say to me, uh, Scott, I would never picture you just tied to suicide. During these conversations, people would ask questions. They would enter into this dialogue with me. For some reason, it worked. And they took something from it and moved on. And when they would say, I would never picture you tied to suicide, I thought, what is that picture? But when I went to look, all I found was cold, dark text, usually about grieving and never about anything you could do about it. And I thought, it needs a picture. And that's where the idea for the book came from. Our whole organization was based on create, telling stories of those left behind. And that's what I wanted to do. So we launched a project in 2009, and people shared their stories by the thousands. I started doing more public speaking, and I was lucky enough to start doing public speaking with an incredible woman, Canadian Inuit artist by the name of Susan Aglukar. And we were up in... In there she is. She's incredible. We're up in Wapakika for the 20th suicide uh, annual uh, Survivor the Suicide Conference. And uh, while we were there, we were there to share stories and share our stories. But one night, Susan asked me, Scott, people are talking about your work all over the country. And it's amazing everywhere I go. But what do you want people to do? I'd never thought about it. I wanted to tell stories, make a book, and move on with my life, right? It was going to be one year. And I struggled. It took about two weeks to answer the question, but I came back to it. All I had to answer the question was my own story. So I looked at what did I want when I was in grade 12? I wanted my teachers to talk about it. So I looked at fact of ed curriculum 33 years ago. There's nothing about suicide. There's still nothing about suicide. I said, I want curriculum-based tools for suicide for teachers so that they can talk to me when I go back to school. Not even to prevent, but it'll do that too. But so I, so that they can teach me and do their jobs. And Susan said, oh, that's good. That's good. Great answer. What else do you want? She said, I promise it's the last question. And so I struggled again. But then I went back to my dad. He was discharged from hospital six times. So I looked at nursing school curriculum. And I looked at med school curriculum. They were empty. Nursing school tucked away in fourth year of normal psych. Uh, med school, it was almost none. And I'm going to talk about NOSM and how we got working with them. And then I also looked at my dad. It was a mill town. All his friends worked in the mill. They were trained in CPR and first aid. If my dad had a cardiac condition, he was in good hands. Uh, they took guns away from my dad, but didn't talk about suicide. Uh, so from that one question and from my one story, all our advocacy came from. That everything we do with our advocacy is about curriculum, policy, and legislation. That if we don't make changes to those things, I believe it's fluff. It's a good thing Andrew's still not here and the bell rep isn't here. <laughs> that when we talk about let's talk, I think we have to get our hands dirty. About what? What's it look like? How does it feel? What is it? And to me, it's tool-based. What tools can you give me as a firefighter to go to calls that involve suicide? When we look at Safe Talk, a three-hour workshop, what tools can teachers have? Well, we can put those in place today, just like CPR and First Aid and WEMIS. What policies can we create? Well, we can create hiring policies. As a firefighter, people want these jobs and police officers and teachers. So when we're hiring people, put things like Safe Talk as a requirement for the job. It costs you nothing, and you get them trained. Educators will do anything to get jobs these days. And they'll go take it. It won't cost anything, but you'll have tools to begin to do something. And so with that, curriculum, policy, and legislation, that's what we have to focus on. And when I look at everybody in this room in the workforce, I know that there's a lot of social workers in here, and people work public health. They did a, a, a social work conference a couple of years ago in Niagara Falls, and I did a poll. I said, how many people in the room are trained in CPR? Almost 75% of the hands went up. I said, how many people are trained in first aid? Same thing. I said, how many people are trained in safe talk or assist or something specific to suicide? But 10 hands went up. And I said, how many cardiac patients come through your door every day? <laughs> the irony was just amazing. Had they changed a the policy, we're graduating social work students without the tools for suicide. I was at a talk last night um, about suicide with the bereavement group. If we did a poll in Sudbury, and ask the community, 
Who do you think in your community has tools to deal with suicide? Their answer would be everybody in this room right now, all of us. And how many people academically in this room have been trained in suicide? That's a significant part. So the hands are coming up, but there's still few. They should be, we should be the professionals. So, so we're running close on time. So I'm going to tell a couple more stories. One of the stories that hit a couple years ago, I started doing some work with Laurentian of all places. And I was doing conference calls out of, out of Thunder Bay. I'd be in one room and they would be in the other. And we did this amazing, that, that from one talk uh, with the interprofessional students, they wanted me to do more. And so we end up, I ended up working with the, 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 the School of Education with Jen Buell, and she's here, and it's beautiful to see her here. And they, and once they started learning about suicide and tools that they could put into their programs, they immediately said, how do we get this here now? And so we ended up doing, doing an event where we trained all the, or I'm not sure if it was all, a, a large number of their, their fac of ed students in Safe Talk. And some of the comments that came out of it, I mean, one of the most powerful ones was from Jan right away who said, I needed this training 25 years ago. And the students were over the top that we need to make this curriculum based so we can't graduate students without it anymore. And the changes that came from it, and at that time we did a lot of media, and it was two or three years ago, we gave the opportunity for school boards to begin to change their policies for hiring. And that was two or three years ago, and it still hasn't changed. So all this time, and what's really sad about that is that we had a family last night at that talk who lost their son two months ago. So we have to begin creating these real changes that we can do. So I'm going to move to Tanya's story. So she's trying to, there, this is Tanya. Tanya is in Burn Church, and I did her photograph a couple of years ago. She saw my exhibits uh, while she was at a center for her methadone treatment, and Tanya wanted to meet me. And when I finally met with her and talked with her, I asked her how she was doing, how she got through this. She had lost her kids, she was, she was addicted. Um, she couldn't do anything since her, her brother's suicide. And I said, why did you want to talk to me? She said, after I saw the stories, I knew I could. So we lined up her with the social worker after seeing the stories to begin working with him. A couple of weeks ago, I got a call from a, from a social worker who, who brought me out. And she said, oh, by the way, I need to tell you about Tanya. She's back in school. She's got her kids back. She's been clean for two years. And she's lost 50 pounds because you let her share her story. The power of telling stories and letting stories be told with vulnerability and honesty is everything. When I started this project in 2009... I invited people to come forward and share their stories. And they did by the thousands. I still can't figure out why they did with me, but they did, and they found a way that they could trust. People came from across Canada and around the world, and they shared their stories with vulnerability, with healing, and hope. But of the thousands of stories that so many people shared with me, I've learned over the last few months in preparing for today that I've only been in search of one story, and that is my own. And the story is about connection, but most of all, the story is about love. That's really what it's about. My challenge to all of you in this room today is to take the stories you've heard today and let it give you the strength, the permission, to tell your story with vulnerability and courage. Let your story give you the strength that you need to create change. Thank you very much.